Hi, my name is uh, Vicki Takeda. I'm with the Yak Lecture Series, and I want to welcome you to Onigiri Squeezed with Love. <laughs> Patty Fong, in her short film called More Than Roast Chicken, states that recipes passed down from generation to generation are often attached to family stories. And at the heart of every family recipe is a story. We hope that your attendance today will spark memories of family stories centered around recipes handed down from parent to child. It is the goal of UI Kai Lecture Series that knowledge gained through your attendance and participation at YAC-sponsored workshops promotes cultural transmission. Transmission for generations to come. Or perhaps create a space for you to make memories while making onigiri squeezed with love, with friends and family members. So again, welcome. We'd like to now begin. Today you will learn through a presentation and demonstration several topics through this workshop. You'll hear about historical cultural importance of rice, everything you need to know about rice, rice basics, the history and role of onigiri with a demonstration by video, onigiri razu video, the bento box, and a hand-on session for crafting your own onigiri and onigiri razu. So, let's begin. I'd like to introduce to you Tom Izu, advisory board member of the San Jose Museum and a member of the UI Kai Lecture Series to present an overview of the historical cultural importance of rice. Tom? So, what is rice? It's oriza sativa in Latin. So if I use Latin, it makes it sound like I know what I'm talking about. So I, I looked it up. <laughs> but <coughs> Orisa Sativa uh, was first grown in this form about 10,000 years ago in the Yangtze River Basin of China. It came from the domestication of what we would call wild rice. In this case, Orisa Rufipangon, or brown beard rice. While it is hailed as the a forebearer of all modern rice, it is also labeled an invasive species and even called a noxious weed here in the US now. I have to say, it does look like the stuff in my, my yard in front of my This act of domestication was incredibly significant technological advancement that eventually led to 50% of humanity relying on cultivated rice in as many forms as a staple crop. It was easy to modify through cultivation and crossbreeding to produce prestigious amounts of edible seeds that packed higher and higher levels of calories, especially when grown in flooded fields or rice paddings. Most importantly, it grew like a weed. As one botanist contributor via Wikipedia, Wikipedia poetically wrote simply, quote, the model organism of the botany of cereals. I, if you're not into botany, maybe that doesn't sound very poetic. But I don't <laughs> sound very so rice invades Japan. Japonica in particular. One of the two major subspecies of rice, Japonica, became the main rice crop of what is now modern Japan during the Jamon period, about 400 BCE, probably brought over by people from the Korean Peninsula, along with red, wet rice cultivation. It turned out that the climate and geography of the Japanese islands were ideal for the style of rice agriculture. Once rice arrived, it had a tremendous impact on the development of the Japanese people on all levels. Rice is omnip omnipresent in Japanese life. Gohan, or cooked rice, is synonymous with food. Gohan, or um, the names, it names all three daily meals. Aso Gohan, breakfast. Hiru Gohan, lunch. Ban Gohan, dinner. And appears in so many forms. Even the byproducts of rice production are evident everywhere. For example, rice straw has been used for thatching roofs, making ropes, bags, sandals, the tommy mats, um, rain cloaks, just to name a few things. Anything important going on in Japan in any time period, rice will be there in some form or another. So Godzilla might be able to destroy parts of Tokyo from time to time, but Japonica rules Japan, and as we shall see, has done so much longer than the giant lizard. In the Nihon Shoki, one of the oldest books written that chronicles the story of Japan, it's about 720 CE, gives the original name of the Japanese islands as, quote, the land where abundant rice shoots ripen beautifully. I guess that's pretty poetic too. 
In fact, the creation story of Japan has the goddess Amaterasu Omikami sending her descendant, Jimu, the first emperor of Japan, to transform this land into one of abundant rice crops. So he was a mighty warrior and hunter, as you think of most emperors or kings, but most importantly, he was a master farm rice farmer. It should be a surprise that many rituals and ceremonies of Shinto practice in particular have rice at their center. Spring festivals for bountiful crops, fall ones to give thanks for the gods, and many others to protect the precious rice from pests and inclement weather. Do you know where the sport of sumo came from? I didn't know this, but I looked it up in Wikipedia. It started as a ritual dance performed for the divine protection of the rice crops and still retains many rice references to this day. Also, of course, it takes a lot of rice to create a sumo wrestler somewhere between five and 10 bowls a day. Rice became not only a symbol of wealth and power and social status, but a key player in the development of Japan's economic system. In feudal Japan, the peasant class paid their taxes to feudal lords and um, in rice, and the samurai class paid rice measured in units of koku. That's the amount of rice estimated to feed one adult for a year. Rice was also exchanged for currency, and, for, and from it arose brokers, rice markets, money changers, and eventually the Japanese banking system itself. The Dojima Rice Exchange, created in the late 1600s in Osaka, is said to have established the first futures trading system, and it was based on rice transactions. So if one of you are in economics, should explain what futures is. Like, that's, I just looked it up and found it, so I stuck it in here. <clears throat> Wet rice cultivation required intensive social organization, including complex communal efforts to provide irrigation systems, utilize limited arable land space efficiently, and people power needed year-round to do the planting, cultivating, harvesting, and the processing of the rice. This necessitated the development of a social culture built on group harmony and avoidance of friction among working people Many believe this created the foundation of Japanese social culture as captured in the word yui, to tie, bind, or weave together, or to join, connect, or organize. A sort of rice-based social stickiness that lives on to this day. Cow rose is a medium grain rice of Japonica, developed in California, a name most of you probably recognize. Japanese Americans played a major role in this development in our state. An example of this is the family legacy of Koda Farms and Kokubo Rose. Kei Saburu Koda, an Issei who arrived in California in the early 1900s, started farming rice during the 1920s, creating new ways of cultivating, cultivating cow rose, and he was nicknamed the Rice King of California. So California today is the second highest producer of rice in the U.S. As Japanese American identifying people, or those who just want to hang out with Japanese Americans, you're all welcome, it doesn't matter what background you are. We are rice sticky, we're full of rice, and we're carrying aspects of this rice tradition forward. We, you can see rice culture everywhere in our community here, and even in some of our family names that contain the kanji uh, for rice paddy or field. So do any of you have a name, ta or da, in it that contains this kanji? A hint, Tanaka, Kawada, Nakada. <laughs> I think film, film, film are appropriate, probably, right? And Oda, Oda. Anyway, the point is, is that it's, it's everywhere, and I didn't realize this really thinking about it because I just took it for granted, but all of us have some connection to rice, and Japanese definitely do. So next up, I have Jane Kawasaki. <coughs> he, she's going to give the crash course in rice basics. Jane has been active and volunteer at the UI, UI High for many, many years, and is now the president of the UI High Board. Hi, thank you, and thanks, Tom. And I can thank Tom for introducing me to UI High. Uh, <laughs> Way long time ago, <laughs> in the early 80s. Um, so I'm going to talk about the basics of rice. Um, I don't definitely not going to cover everything you need to know or you want to know. There's a lot as I uh, was researching. There's a lot of unconfirmed information about rice and lots of different opinions. So this is my best attempt. Basic rice varieties. Um, I think people know long, medium, and short grain. This is just a description of uh, you know how the dimensions are different for them. Uh, really, the the long grain rice is fluffy, firm, doesn't stick together, um, and uh, medium grain is uh, tender, moist, slightly chewy, has moderate stickiness, and then the short grain rice, uh, the the rice grain cling together. When you look at the use of rice worldwide, the number one rice around the world is long grain. Medium grain is the number one rice 
for Japanese food cooked in the United States. So Japanese restaurants um, use generally medium grain rice. Historically, um, it's California grown. Short grain is the traditional rice that is used in Japan. Uh, so in sushi and in you know everyday rice cooking in Japan, it's short grain rice, and that includes um, mochi gome, which is the um, rice to uh, make mochi. I'm going to focus on medium grain and short grain rice because that's what we use to make honigiri. Okay, so is rice good for you? <laughs> yeah, I mean yes. 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 Okay, so um, based on what I could find, you know, so in general, rice is good for you. It has, you know, lots of nutrients. That's why people around the world eat it. It's very nutritious. It's got um, lots of essential vitamins and minerals. It's gluten free, which means for people, you know, who have gluten issues, um, it's uh, good to eat. Also, it's the least allergenic. Uh, of the grains. So if you have, you know, other kinds of uh, wheat allergies, you know, you can eat rice. Uh, it's also sodium free, cholesterol free, depends on what you do with it, but the <laughs> base rice is. Uh, and there's, uh, it, it increases serotonin, so it can make you happy. <laughs> it, increases, it improves your mood. Um, and then specifically for brown rice, because it still has the germ and the bran, you know, it, uh, it, it has more fiber, uh, it reduces the risk of heart disease, high blood pressure, diabetes, and certain cancers. Um, the downside is it is harder to digest because of that, you know, extra fiber. Um, and uh, sometimes it's not recommended for uh, small children or the elderly because of that uh, digestion issue. Um, and it, there is some uh, indication it has higher arsenic levels, so they don't recommend that you eat it all the time. Uh, you know, several times a week is okay. Um, white rice, easy to digest, gives you quick energy, um, but you know, it has some you know, issues with uh, 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 gly glycemia and you know, increases the risk of diabetes. And we'll talk about you know, how we can address uh, at least some of these issues um, as, I, as I go through this presentation. There's so many different types of rice if you go to the store. Um, so I just wanted to highlight a few and in your handouts, um, I have more detailed descriptions, I think on, in the table, on you know, all these different variants of rice. Musen Mai rice is rice that is labeled no wash. You see the little, this is my standard brand of rice, Nishiki is medium grain rice. And it has the little cute little face on it. It says, just add water. So it is, goes through a special milling process that um, does not require washing. Aww. So um, <laughs> what uh, you'll find is that if you get rice, um, like in Japan, school lunches, they all use musen mai. Um, and commercial cooking, you know, large volume places also use musen mai. One, it, you don't have to wash it. It's a lot less processing. And it's also better for the environment because all of that um, starchy, nutrient-rich stuff that comes out when you wash rice, uh, like especially in, in high volume, um, you know, it goes out into uh, rivers and lakes and that extra nutrition fosters the growth of algae, which pollutes the, the rivers, lakes, and oceans. So to be better for the environment and easier for you, you know, moose and mai is, you know, is, is growing in popularity. Uh, Haiga mai is, oh, is uh, sort of a, a half and half uh, between white rice and brown rice. So it has the bran, you know, the uh, fibrous parts removed, but it keeps the, the germs, so it's highly, it's highly nutritious. It's easier to digest and softer and more tender than the brown rice, but more nutritious um, than the white rice. A type of rice that has um, recently, you know, been uh, popularized and, and, you know, and written about as being uh, very healthy for you is called gamba rice. It has a gamma amino 
<laughs> whatever is out of the thing. Uh, that that um, help, helps it digest more slowly, so it ferments in your uh, digestive system, um, and so it is um, supposedly much healthier for you. It is, you know, basically germinated brown rice, and um, so we have a bag that we'll be giving away as a raffle prize. Um, but it is more expensive. Um, but um, I think in the table, you can make it yourself if you start out with whole grain brown rice. If you soak it for a day or or so um, until it starts to sprout, then you just uh, wash it in. Uh, cook it and you have your own gaba rice. Okay, so other considerations for buying and storing rice. Obviously, a new crop is going to be fresher and, and uh, you know, uh, tastier than uh, old rice, so that's something to look for. And uh, grain quality, um, so you want to see, you know, full grains. Uh, during the milling process, sometimes, you know, grain uh, kernels get <coughs> broken. Um, I think they sell broken rice separately in uh, some markets, and, and it is used in other uh, cooking, but for onigiri, where we want, and Japanese cooking, where we want to see the, the grains of rice, um, you want to look for, you know, quality grains, um, if, you, if you can see through the hole. But, you know, the, the high premium brands generally are going to have the, the full grain. And when you bring it home, you want to store it in a cool, dry, and airtight environment. Um, and just uh, something I noticed is that if you look on some rice bags, it will say don't store in a moist location because they are the bags are breathable, and so they will absorb moisture or you know other uh, impurities in the air. Uh, you know if they're not in the plastic bags. Question about how long you can store uncooked rice. Um, and in general, the white rice, you know, which is milled rice, uh, supposedly keeps indefinitely. Although, you know, after a year or so, you, you kind of get some weird smells. Um, <laughs> and it may not taste good, quite, quite as good. I don't know, during the pandemic, did anybody like find and use old rice? <laughs> and notice, oh, it's not quite the same. So um, that's something to, to think about. Uh, in a pinch, you can eat it. Uh, whole grain <laughs> rice, though, because it has oil in the bran, um, it only lasts about six months. So you know, don't like overstock on brown rice. Uh, or if you know, or if you do, you know, if you want to keep keep it longer, you can refrigerate it or freeze it um, for a longer shelf life. Okay, so washing rice. How many people wash their rice? Okay, and where did you learn how to uh, wash your rice? <laughs> okay, so you're at, for all rice except for that musen mai, uh, the, the no wash rice, yeah, uh, rice does require washing. Okay, so here's a little demonstration of uh, uh, what we learned from uh, <clears throat> Uh, Nami about the right way to wash rice uh, is the first thing you should do is to fill it with a lot of water, do an easy rinse and pour it out uh, to get rid of all of the surface, you know, dust, dirt, uh, starch, excess starch. And then you drain that, that starchy, dirty stuff and then you fill it with just a little bit of water, just right about at the level of the, the rice. And then you do this claw um, and then you really kind of scrub around in the, in the rice. And you know, you're trying to rub off all that extra um, starch uh, so that you get nice uh, individual grains of rice. All right. Okay, and then, uh, yeah. yeah, and then you, I think it might be playing again. Wash yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's a good point. Because actually, you want to keep doing that, you know, two or three times until you get to where you can see through the water the, the individual grains of rice. So, you win. <laughs> okay, how about soaking rice? 
Does everybody soak their rice? Yes. How long do you soak your rice? 30 minutes. Does everybody soak their rice? So I see no's and I see yeses. Okay. So, all right, that was my question. And then, so here's the rationale for soaking rice and the, and the guidance. It's 20 to 30 minutes um, after rinsing, and that helps ensure fluffy grains of rice. Um, so, and especially if you're going to use Japanese rice, the short grain rice, because it's plump, uh, it really needs that soaking time to start, you know, absorbing the water. Okay, um, measuring rice. So, how do you measure your rice? <laughs> okay, so, how many people just use what the rice cooker says? The lines on the rice cooker. Okay. How many people measure, actual use a measuring cup and measure the same amount of rice, the water as the rice? Okay. How many people use the knuckle method? <laughs> oh, okay. Any, any other ways that people use to measure rice? NAMI, who we reference a lot, uh, has a recommended ratio, uh, you know, from just one cookbook, uh, of 1.2 cups of water uh, for every one cup of rice. Um, and this is her recommendation for how you do it, is you actually measure equal amounts of rice and water. And then you go through that washing, rinsing, and soaking process for 20 to 30 minutes, during which the rice absorbs water about that 20%. And then you drain it, and then you add that, that, that measured cup amount of water. Mm -hmm. Obviously, if you have a new crop of rice, you need a little less water. Mm -hmm. if, you, if your rice has been sitting around and you know, drying out for longer, you might need more water. And different brands you know, vary, as well as different tastes. So you know, if you like the way your rice comes out, you know, in whatever way you're measuring it is, it's probably right for you. Yeah. The people who said the knuckle method, yeah. um, mm -hmm. how did you know it worked? It came out right. Okay, because there's always all these questions about, gee, everybody's different, and how do you make sure that it, you know, how do you know that's the right amount? So I went to uh, the Exploratorium, had a, a little scientific study about this. <laughs> And what they found is, regardless of your hand size, the distance from your fingertip to that first joint is relatively consistent. So here's a picture of you know, a person with a small hand, a person with a large hand, but the knuckle distance is the same. If you want to, you know, if you want to see, <laughs> compare with your neighbor or, or with Bowman over here. <laughs> but that's, you know, who knew? Does it matter which finger? Oh, <laughs> I think it's the index finger. The one that I what, you know, why is it that the same amount, you know, just um, height? <laughs> Uh, works no matter how much rice you're cooking, right? Because it doesn't matter if you're doing one cup or ten cups. You know, one knuckle is one knuckle, right? And you're like, how does, why is that? But what, it's, uh, what it turns out is that, that um, there's water that's also in there with the rice, right? Up to the level of the rice, there's still water. And that's kind of the linear <coughs> amount. And the amount that you put above is uh, what evaporates. For kind of a standard cooking pot, you know, that same dis di distance is gonna work no matter how much rice you're cooking because that pot is gonna evaporate at a certain level be based on the size of the pot. What about a really tall, small diameter pot? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so there might be corners, <laughs> but you know, it's, it's interesting to know that what people had kind of learned from, you know, their experience or their parents or their grandparents, there's some scientific backup for it. But after you've got your rice, it's cooked, you know, you, obviously you need to make allow for it to steam, uh, you know, 
covered for at least 10 minutes. A lot of rice cookers have that setting, so it, it beeps when it's <laughs> done that 10 minutes afterwards, so you don't have to think. Um, but then you want to gently fluff that rice with uh, shamochi, um, and you want to use a folding and cutting slicing method, not smooshing. <laughs> oh. Yeah, because you want to keep those grains fluffy and uh, individualized. And then for storing cooked rice, um, <clears throat> Nami recommends putting it in, the, in an airtight container in the freezer. And she recommends, you know, just going, you know, when you're done cooking and you're done eating, put it in right away and cover it so you don't lose the moisture when you, before you put it in the freezer. You, you probably want to cover it and then let it sit to cool down so you don't mess up your freezer. <laughs> but um, try to, you know, don't like leave it open for a long time because it'll just get hard and dry. Um, and then this is a, an interesting fact from, that Susan found for us, right? That there is uh, something about um, after you cook the rice, if you cool it down below 40 degrees and reheat it, um, you know how we're talking about how, the, how white rice um, you know, increases the risk of diabetes. Well, if you eat reheated, cooled rice, um, that rice is has developed something called resistant starch. And that is actually better for your gut health and glycemic control than if you eat that rice fresh out of the pot. I'm gonna turn it over to Susan Hayase who is going to actually talk about the onigiri that uh, we're advertising. So um, I'm going to talk about onigiri. And you know how Tom talked about the rise of Japanese culture? Well, I'm going to um, entertain you for a moment with the decline of Japanese culture. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, this is just a joke. I'm just kidding. <laughs> but but there, there are all forms of onigiri, and people do funny things with onigiri. And so um, this is a traditional. <laughs> so the, the picture on the top is, um, it's called a shima enagi, and it's called a long-tailed tit. It's a very tiny bird that's found in Hokkaido, and apparently they have fan clubs, but they look like onikiri, and they're about the same size. They're really tiny. And the picture on the bottom are three little uh, shima enagi onigiri, um, but they're also, they're, there's this, um, in Japan they call it yanki, and it's, I think it comes from Yankee, but it's kind of like the culture of American juvenile delinquency. <laughs> <laughs> These are little juvenile delinquents. <laughs> <laughs> and um, uh, Tom was saying how uh, uh, rice uh, permeates Japanese culture. So. See this picture? There's, there's apparently trending. So there's there's no rice in this picture, but you just see this picture and you you think of a rice ball. <laughs> History of onigiri. So um, when I was uh, doing some research, I was shocked to find out that you know ohashi or chopsticks were only popularized in Japan in I think the eighth century, which shocked me because I kind of thought maybe it was like really prehistoric. But so what that means is that. Prior to the invention of ohashi, uh, people had to, you know, use their hands for food, and so, uh, and the sticky rice makes uh, really good finger food. Um, this photo is from a from Ishikawa Prefecture, and I guess they found some fossilized onigiri, <laughs> and the archaeologists were calling them carbonized rice lumps. Um, and they actually had finger marks in them. So uh, anyway, so this is 300 BCE. Okay, so we've been saying onigiri, but I'd like people to raise their hand if they grew up calling them musubi. Well, just a couple. Oh. Okay, so everybody else grew up calling them onigiri? Yeah. Or did we ask, are they from California or Oh yeah, so, so people who uh, called yeah. them Musubi, where are you from? <laughs> Hawaii. Hawaii? Hawaii. 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 Yeah. Hawaii. Oh, that's interesting. Okay, this is like a, a mystery, so it's kind of debatable, and a lot of this information is very speculative. But there's a phrase called um, 
En no musubu, and it means to um, connect. And um, people think this, this is from Shinto, and uh, uh, there's also an idea that, that uh, the mountains were considered to be deities, and they're kind of onigiri, is like mountain-shaped, you know. But this was a term that was used by the upper classes. So people who call it Usubi can. <laughs> <laughs> this, uh, I like this, uh, it's a stock image, and it, it's uh, called Angry Japanese Peasants. <laughs> so I figure they're angry because they're waiting for their onigiri. Um, but, uh, so common people uh, call it onigiri. And I think the phrase is oni o kiru, and it means to strike down the demons. And um, also, if you look at the kanji, uh, the first kanji is nigi, and that means uh, to grip or to grab. So like, you know, a rice ball you can grab. So uh, I got this list from Just One Cookbook, which I highly recommend if you've never seen that before, it's online. But these are just a bunch of things that she suggests that you can um, use to fill your onigiri. Now you don't have to, you can have an uh, onigiri with nothing inside and put nori on the outside or furikake on the outside or whatever, but you can also uh, explore different ways to uh, fill it. And today, um, we're gonna provide these things that you could use to fill your onigiri that you're going to make. So the upper left-hand corner is umeboshi. Upper right-hand corner is uh, katsuobushi with shoyu, so that's bonito flakes with shoyu. Um, on the lower left is uh, tuna mayo, and then that's a, a jar of furikake. How many make onigiri using a mold? <laughs> no shame, no shame. So we, we're not we're not anti mold, but we're really pro hand. So we're gonna show you how to um, make onigiri with your hands. Now, uh, partly because of this idea that um, this is something that you can learn. You know, you pass on. It's not something that you learn in school, but it's something that maybe your parent. Uh, taught you. So I remember my mother used to whip out onigiri for our uh, lunches when we went on car trips. And I was so uh, confused, like how could she do this and then whip out this little triangle? Mm -hmm. And so I made her show me her hands because I thought there was something different about her hands. <laughs> you know, but anyway, I'm going to show you. So, so first of all, um, everybody, uh, before we like go out and make our own, everybody's gonna wash their hands. Yeah, I washed my hands a while ago, but I, you know, but I'll eat my own. <laughs> so, oh, that's okay. I got salt here. So uh, here's some uh, rice, and here's a, uh, some salt, and then here's water. So you need to wa uh, wet your hands, or else the rice will really stick. It'll stick anyway. But and then you can dip your fingers in the salt and then rub it on the palms of your hands. Okay. You can make really giant ones, or you can make really tiny ones like the little bird. But I'm gonna just grab this much. I think this is like about a third of a cup or something, I don't know. It's, nobody measures this stuff. Right? But what you do is you, oh, and uh, you can make a little hole in it and put your filling in, right? But I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna do that. But what you do is you start squeezing it See, just like the picture, right? And you kind of turn it, and you squeeze it some more. And you, you don't want to squeeze it so hard that it, you know, everything just disintegrates. But it has to hold together, right? So you just do that a couple times, and you end up with a little triangle. <laughs> okay, I'm back again. Um, so how many people have heard about onigirazu? Okay, a few. All right, that's good, that's good. Um, so um, what onigirazu means is without squeezing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's a, a new variant on rice balls without having to squeeze the rice in your hands, although that's such a wonderful tactile thing. But um, the name was coined um, by Tochi Ueyama, the author of a manga series called Cooking Papa. 
Anybody heard about Cooking Papa? Yeah, I see a couple. All right, and um, in, in 1991. So in it, um, the main character, who was a working father, um, Kazumi Araiwa, he made this time-saving lunch. So it's a shortcut um, uh, of an onikiri for his eldest son, who was in elementary school. So he was making a, a bento lunch for his son. and. Quick and easy, onigirazu. And it was so popular um, that it you know, got uh, voted the dish of the year in Japan wow. in 2015. Um, you can also call it rice sandwich or sushi sandwich. Um, and we're, we are making you know, um, basically a rice sandwich. But you, there is a variant where you can use sushi rice, you know, actually put sushi seasoning in it and, you know, be like an easy shortcut sushi. The basics of onigirazu making. So you uh, lay out, um, in Japan they use a lot of plastic, but we're using wax paper. Uh, and you put the nori at a diagonal so that the point, you know, one point is facing you. This is a very tidy person, but you can just scoop <laughs> the rice onto uh, the uh, nori, add whatever fillings you want, and um, you know you can go with traditional musubi fillings, you know like ueboshi uh, or the katsuobushi, the um, okaka. Um, but you can make it. You can use anything that you have left over in your refrigerator, you know, last night's dinner, you know, karaage chicken, um, beef teriyaki, you can make, you know, use kimchi and bulgogi, you can, yeah, and you can layer in um, vegetables, you know, shiso, we have uh, cucumber and carrots and um, cabbage, uh, and you just layer that, lay that on top of your rice, and then you add another layer of rice, and then you just fold up the corners. And, and then you let it sit for a little while, and then you cut it open, and voila, you have your onigirasu. Okay, so this is our little video of our sample, <laughs> our group, uh, and you have to guess whose hands those are. Um, we had our, meeting, our committee meeting as we were planning, and, and uh, everybody had to make their own on onigirasu. So there you go. See, we're putting uh, cucumber, and uh, so we did a lot similar to what we have today, ham and, and uh, uh, tamagoyaki, avocado, which we, didn't, we don't have avocado today. <laughs> That's iffy. If you get a good avocado, it's good, but yeah. for a crowd, it's tough. Uh, and then we had a shiso leaf. And then she's folding up the corners. And with a little dab of water to you know, make the nori stick. And then you flip it over, so you kind of put some weight on it. You push it down. As it sticks together, you can wrap it up with the wax paper. And then they recommend letting it sit for a while. You know, you can get really fancy with the um, way you arrange the fillings. So, you know, w you know which way you want to cut it so that you get a nice um, view of all of the key ingredients. Uh, you know, everything in Japan is artistic. Um, the cutting process, after it's been sitting and... Ta-da! <laughs> it's all about the fillings, you know, so you can be as creative as you uh, want. You can use your favorite foods. Um, so today we have tamagoyaki, uh, we have kimchi, we have lettuce, carrots, cucumbers, takuan, and sliced ham. Uh, and you know we have furikake on the tables, and you know other condiments. There's some kewpie mayonnaise if you want mayonnaise in your sandwich. <laughs> so uh, think about what kinds of things you want to have today. And with that, now that you have your Onigiri and Susan May, your onigirazu that, that um, I showed. Um, what are you going to do with all of those? Well, they go in a bento box. And so I'm going to uh, have Margaret come up next, and she is going to talk about bentos. Yeah. <laughs> 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 I realized that I'm doing everything.
anything wrong about <laughs> washing rice. I've never used the claw method in my life. <laughs> I've never done the rinse and add the water and later. My brown rice has spoiled because I don't leave it airtight. <laughs> and my closet is not waterproof. <laughs> and I hoard. I buy 12 sacks of put of Last over here, and it's way too long. So I learned a lot today, so that, that is very good. So uh, let's go and take you to, because it, this is not working, let us now take you to Pacific Grove. So you're going to have a trip in a couple days to Pacific Grove with your friends, and you're going to take lunch on the beach. You can anticipate the warm sun, the seagulls, the smell of the seaweed. And you have enough time, because you're leaving about 11, to either buy lunch or pack your lunch to take on this picnic. So talk to someone near you. Yeah, you can talk to her. Okay. Do you know her? Okay. <laughs> What would you bring? What would you bring? Go ahead, go ahead and talk to you. Okay, let's hear what you would bring for a dental lunch. Oh, by the way, if you respond faster, we can eat lunch faster. Oh. <laughs> Give us Christine, thank you. Most of the chicken that I get from the night before. Okay, someone else, come on. What would you bring? Spam musubi. Yep. Spam musubi. Something you want with your hands. Yes. Okay, so actually a group of us in here, actually we go once a year with our hunter group to Pacific Row, we rent a house, and we're going to have a picnic lunch. Mm -hmm. So I brought two musubi with the inside, mm -hmm. and then carrots and apple. Someone else brought a peanut butter jelly sandwich with potato mm -hmm. chips. Someone bought a cranberry turkey sandwich from Paris by yeah. oh, oh, I know. I know. <laughs> and then, uh, someone else brought a, she's from Japan, nice formed nigiri, uh, tamagoyaki, kamaboko. Wow. Wow. So that I know. So anyway, those of you who didn't say because you didn't raise your hand, uh, I'm going to say why not a bento. What are some reasons to bring a bento instead of store-bought lunch? And I'm going to give you three reasons. One, you're going to save money. Secondly, it's more nutritious. And third, it's easy and easy, very easy and fast, if you have the ingredients at your home. So that's what I'm going to try to explain. So let's talk about a typical fast food. <laughs> oh, you recognize this, don't you? It's the Wendy. You do? Yeah. What is it? It's the Wendy Big Me. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, wait. Guess which city in the United States has the highest average cost for what uh, for a typical hamburger combo? Which city? Since you said it, just where do you think the most expensive average cost for a fast food burger is? San Francisco. Number one. San Francisco. I'm going to give you a raffle prize for that. <laughs> First, you raised your hand and you were right. Number two is Los Angeles, and the third is New York. <coughs> now, if you want, that's $16.50. Oh However, when I called to put an order in yesterday, it's $19 with tax. But that's the medium. You get the medium, though. It's not the small. It's not the oh, son of Baconator. <laughs> <laughs> The, the combo. The combo. Yeah, okay. I phone because I can't. No, no, the whole. Oh, the sandwich is about eight or nine dollars. And a drink. So, uh, what was I saying? Now I forgot. Uh, oh, oh, if you are trying to save money and buy the cheapest burger for six dollars and fifty cents, you have to move to Tulsa, Oklahoma. Okay. So I don't want to tell you about the calories, but you're going to have to run for two and a half hours, oh. <laughs> do bicycling for four hours, or do 10 hours of housework. Oh. Oh. No. I'm going to give you an alternative. Look at this. What is the difference you see visually between a bento and a onigirazu, the Japanese sandwich? Let's all now talk at once. No. What's the difference? 
It's cute. It's cute. It's very important. Thank you. You get a raffle prize too. Yeah. <laughs> the rest are, you know, I'll just talk to you too. We've got shirts, we've got a pack of Japanese rice. All right, ready? So you better know the answers too. Okay. What else about this makes it very uh, what are the what why is it? It's visually easy. It's more colorful. Oh thank you. Yes. It's low fat. It's low fat. What else? You can make easy. Yes, so thank these are the right answers in terms of the vegetables you put in there are more fresh, they're less processed. The vegetable in a school lunch. It's the ketchup over here. That's considered a vegetable. <laughs> but anyway, uh, so the, look at the oniki dazu. Here's what you do. You have a small bit of bulgogi beef. It's not enough for to eat. You take that small piece, put that in your oniki dazu, put some sauteed bean sprouts, mushroom, carrots, mm. and an egg, and you fold it, and you really have a complete meal. Mm -hmm. Plus the nori is good for you too. Yeah. That's what is the non thing. So you see the difference here. Plus it's a recyclable container. You, you use it and reuse it. If you buy this, you have all kinds of paper you can know, reuse. Mm -hmm. Now children like bentos. And this is Tab, who, Tabitha, who is 10 years old. Her first attempt at mm -hmm. explaining her viewpoint about making one yigi. So this is unedited. She did everything on this, the script. I am the baby and day for lunch. <laughs> because you can make a bento. You can use bento books or you could follow along on this video. Bentos are a fun, easy way to cook and impress your friends at lunch. Here are examples of things I like to use in my bentos. I like to use rice molds, reusable containers, Cookie cutters, noti punches, toothpicks, the cuter the better, and scissors. a certain category called Kiana Bento, which is oh. character bento. That is, oh. they, they call it a category that mothers, you know, historically mothers made bentos for their children to show their love, for the care and thought. They would always make attractive bentos. But now it's become where it becomes character bento, it becomes quite elaborate. And why are bentos good for kids first? If it's cute, they will eat it. <laughs> and if it's a small portion, they will eat it. So say, oh, that nut was really good. Just take a bite. <laughs> you know, so. But small portion and a variety of foods they'll be eating too. So those two. However, I'd like to talk about allergies. Because um, there is a grandson who plays soccer at 13s. He has allergic to wheat, eggs, milk, 
fish. So essentially he could eat rice and meat, I think, allergic to everything. So if you have allergies, bentos are really a good option to have. So these are character bentos. However, so everyone is expected in Japan to make bentos, but the, the mother especially. But there is sort of a downside to it, the expectation. So uh, if I would say to Carolyn, why didn't your mother make your bento today? You bought a store-bought bento, is she ill? <laughs> so that's the expectation. Oh. Or someone from Australia, uh, she came to the, uh, her school and she's Caucasian and she, after a week the lunch, the teacher approaches her and says, oh, uh, uh, I'd like to show the kind of bentos the other kids are bringing. She shows some photographs of the bentos. Mm -hmm. So there is the dark side of being part of this sticky culture where you're supposed to conform. And you know those kids are comparing their mentals, right? Right? So that, that's one down, downside. But again, it's good for kids, small portion, introduce them to a variety very early in life. And it's cute, they might eat it. So, uh, what's my next slide? Oh, here. It's quick and easy. I asked Miyoko, who works here, she's from Japan. She still makes mentals for her college age daughter. Oh, that's a lot of work. This is a Trader Joe special. <laughs> you can buy the fried rice at Trader Joe. Two portions, freeze one, use one. The shumai is from Trader Joe's. She says it's cheaper than the ones you can buy at the store. Mm -hmm. Well, what about the meatballs? You made those. Trader Joe. <laughs> and then I said, oh, the spinach. Buy small package of spinach, baby spinach, microwave it for 45 seconds, put a little dashi, and she used agave syrup for sweetness, and then she makes the tamagoyaki. But that's a trader joke. See how easy it is? So I want to make it easy for you to make a bento, and you do it by having something called a bento stash <laughs> at your house. So in my home, I would have in my cupboard furikake, ume, maybe ume. A lot of beans, canned beans, dried beans. Uh, then in my refrigerator, I would have maybe skimono, leftovers. And in the freezer, some frozen things from Costco that I could put in the bento. So can you talk very quickly, because you know it's already 10, I want to spend just a couple more minutes. What would you have in your stash? Talk to each other. And there might be a prize involved if oh, you raise your hand. So go ahead, Tom. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, does anyone oh, have something they'd like to share? Yes, back there. You, you always have a yeah, Thank you. Remind me to come up to me, you get a prize. Oh, yes. I always put leftovers from the night before. So if I have chicken or meat, that goes in the bed. Yes, thank you. So that's the kind of stash you would have at home. Come four of you see me afterwards. <laughs> All right, what am I doing next? Here it is. Now the last group are seniors like me. Who need to, the numbers start going up as we gauge A1C, blood pressure, cholesterol. So I need to have a healthy diet. So the size bento box you're getting today is the ideal portion for a female. This is the size you can take home today. It's about 16 to 17, 700 millimeters, three cups is an ideal por portion size to serve yourself for a female. And I prefer Japanese vegetables, and you'll see that these are packed with nutrients, especially kabuchao and kombu. So here's what I, this is not, this is for demonstration purposes. I've never made a bento like this. <laughs> <laughs> this I had at home, right? I always have brown rice. It's actually multi-grain rice, it's very dark. I had to put the green on there to liven it up. <laughs> I had red peppers in the, uh, refrigerator, I have leftover salmon, I made kabocha, and then I had to stage it by lifting the lettuce, and this took, this took, this took a long time. <laughs> <laughs> However, I want to talk about rice, so the, the rice. What do you think is the rock star of rice, the most healthy one you should be eating three times a day? Brown. 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 Not brown, oh, yeah. black rice. Oh. Oh. Forbidden rice because it was forbidden only the emperor could eat it for his health. So that is the rock star. Look it up on the medical journal. Because it has nutrients, says this, the fiber, everything. That's what you should be eating. But it photographs horribly. 
you know, black. That's why you don't see it much. But this has a mixture of black rice, and that's the package I buy. So that is a senior bento. <laughs> and then there's the idea of portion control. I know we're running out of time, but you see this? I happen to say, oh, this looks like the diabetic portion, which I never heard about. I started reading about. You have portions, right? Divide it, divide it in four. So you want little starchy vegetables and stuff like that. You could portion, and I portion that so it's one fourth as rice. You can move that little thing so if you're sort of watching as a senior like me. So, to move, moving right along. Oh, oh, oh I don't know. Uh -oh. <laughs> There's one more I want to show you. I want to show you more. Show you. These are bentos created out of love mother, the grandmother, but sometimes anger, <laughs> the beautiful housewife is angry at her husband, she's going to re get revenge the next day. It's called the Angry Housewives Revenge Bento. Oh my god. <laughs> this one, if you don't read Japanese, baka, which means idiot, idiot, idiot. So that's what he would get. <laughs> She's trying to kill him with sodium, all that oh. umeboshi. Oh. <laughs> so let's go back to the happy place. <laughs> and I hope that all of you will consider, consider making a bento. It's cheaper, nutritious, it's good for you. Plus, the most important part, you're carrying on a cultural tradition of your ancestor, whose name was probably had a ta or da in it. <laughs> he was a rice farmer. Plus, he would have a koshi bento here, maybe a ube boshi or something. So you're carrying on a cultural tradition that is very important. So uh, anyway, I've been rushing because Uawi. So I'm going to end here. And the next slide will be, we're not going to share bento tips. We're going to go to Vicky Takena <coughs> on what's the next step. Yay, let's <laughs> give a hand to all the boys. Speakers. I think they need to do a Saturday Night Live skit <laughs> about rice and onigiri. Anyway, your next steps are these. And um, I think it's important, as uh, Susan has said, is that uh, we're going to give you an opportunity to go and wash your hands. But before you w go and wash your hands, what, what we would like you to do is to pick up your chairs and find the spot where you put your name tags when you first entered. Um, you will also be given the handouts for you to keep, and those will be distributed or you collected them when you first came in. Okay, and then you'll have a survey, and we would greatly appreciate if all of you would turn those in. They really do help us in the future with next workshops. It informs us about what you're interested in, and um, how we do in terms of presenting information. Um, and you'll also be given a UI Kai senior membership, and we would like, if you're interested, to fill that one out as well, because we would like to get you, if you're a new member, um, we would like to get you on our email list so we can alert you to uh, all the workshops and services and programs and volunteer opportunities as well. We've got to acknowledge UI Kai. Thank you so much. So thank you all of those who support us and make this workshop uh, possible. So thank you. You attend more workshops, you will see more creative ways to turn cheese balls into I'm so hungry. <laughs> Did you taste it? Yeah. yeah. So <laughs> I put so much food, I couldn't wrap it. Where do we go to Curry? Hey. You've done this before.
No, never. Like oh, oh, that's so pretty! Oh, nice! Oh, wow. Okay, let's take a look. You get to show Henry. <laughs> you have to get her Yoda. Did you see her Yoda? That's a beauty. Thank you. <laughs> this is my first time making this. Very good. Perfect. Send me a picture. I sent it to the committee and they We can finish up our program. So Margaret made these. These are multi grains. You have that unhealthy white rice. You can make it a little healthier by put, put, putting in with your rice. See if you like multi grain. This is about for about one or it gives the directions here. So you each get one. So do they? Does it have to be washed? No. Okay. No. <laughs> okay. Yeah, this is UI High. This is part of a speaker series. Um, the reason the fee is higher, it is a fundraiser for UI High, uh, so the classes, and we want to encourage you to join the senior membership. So, starting with the next uh, workshop, the Goal workshop, um, if you're a senior club member, it looks like it's like a $5 difference. Okay. The number, the last three digits are 845. 845. Oh, yeah. <laughs> the next one is a just one cookbook sweatshirt. Oh. And the number is 832. We will do another um, sweatshirt. 835. 835. Yay, Christine. Uh, ladies, medium. It won't fit. It won't fit. You want a large? Yeah. Large is better. Can you just pick the next one? Okay, the next one is a medium. Don't get a choice. Uh, so you have to share this. <laughs> eight four two. Oh, eight four two. Oh. Eight four two. 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 One cookbook, <laughs>
So you have to tell us where you live, so we'll come over for our meeting tomorrow. 809. 809. Thank you. Right, I'm, I'm mixing up. Okay. Oh, you're the I know you want to <laughs> 822. So this is to go on your way. 849. Three more. I'm sorry. That's my So uh, one of the suggestions from table one was, wouldn't this be a great event at your next family gathering with friends or with family? And you put out a spread like this, and um, you'll, you'll be a rock star. <laughs> so that's a way to, to then pass on a tradition, a cultural tradition, but those of you who are sitting at tables, and you are the person, um, it would be great to pass that on as well to family and to uh, friends and family. So um, there's a little bit more food up here if you'd like uh, a little bit of a little bit more practice. But what we would really like for you to do is to take the time to fill out that survey. And if you have a desire, please become a member, a senior member, and so you have that form as well. So we welcome you to become a member and look forward to seeing you again. But please stay and visit with one another and um, maybe make another onigiri. Thank you so much. And guess what? Did any of you notice um, the yak team? We look like those cute kawaii ba little babies. Yeah, so how many of you noticed that we were all up there over here who really ought to be leading a class on improv? Um, but that's Margaret. And we have uh, our technician here, Bowman. And Kathy is our consummate. Everything you ever wanted to know about a cheese ball. <laughs> and Jane, she's our fearless leader. She's the one that kind of keeps us on task and does it with a, the best smile you'd ever want to be greeted with. LaDonna is everything dot your I's and cross your T's and raffle. She loves raffle. Tom, Tom is our uh, person who is everything history. We have workshop, he's going to dig into the books and, and find out the history behind whatever we do. So thank you so much, Tom. And Susan here, she is everything creative and she comes up with the best titles. I think she needs to go work for a major publisher because uh, authors would be looking for her titles to help sell her books. So thank you so much, Susan. She came up with Squeezed with Love. <laughs> and here is Sharon. Um, <laughs> Sharon is the person who comes with everything. You know, she, you, need, you need the person who has all the extras. 
and she is the person that comes with the bag of goodies. So thank you so much, Sharon. And uh, are we missing someone from the Yak team? Oh, me? Yeah. Oh. I'm Vicki. <laughs> I'm the curious person, so I always go around and ask people questions, because I'm the one that wants to know uh, who you are and what you do, and um, I'd rather talk to people than watch TV, because you're more fun and interesting, and none of you are the same, so it's like picking up a new book every day. So thank you, thank you for answering my questions, number one, and number two, for letting me ask obnoxious questions, so thank you so much. Thank you.